Hello and welcome to SEL, the Subject Composition and Light podcast, episode two. My name's Rob uh, from robnonphoto.com um, and I'm an enthusiastic amateur photographer who's doing his best to share his learning experiences um, in becoming a better photographer um, with everybody else. So um, my main website is www.robnonphoto.com and you can find me on Flickr. My Flickr handle is ScaleSpeeder um, and there's links on the on uh, rubnonphoto.com to Flickr and there'll be all the show notes for this particular podcast and the uh, the links we'll talk about on there as well. <coughs> what I'd like to do today is talk about what I've been doing in the last week or so, uh, photo walks I've been on um, and then a short discussion about camera form factor. Um, thinking about cameras in terms of their sort of size and shape and how that can affect what you're going to be using them for and which is the best sort of size or shape for you and the sort of pictures uh, you take. So, ooh, what I've been doing since the last podcast, um, the weather's been really, really sunny here um, uh, in Gosport in Hampshire and the south coast of England, um, but a little bit too sunny for lots of landscape shots. Um, the sun's been sort of burning off the clouds pretty quick in the morning, um, and as, as I've got kids, sort of thing, I can't get up at the crack of dawn and go out and take shots during the golden hour because I've got breakfast to make and kids to get up and get ready for school. Um, so what I have been doing is taking quite a lot of macro shots. Um, so I've been to a place called the Alva Valley, which is like a nature reserve in Gosport. Um, and it's, it's a quite a revelation there, actually. It's a really, really quite cool place. Um, there's lots of sort of woodland trails you can follow. and But then there's some some um, exposed areas as well. Um, it's a bit like moorland, some of it. But there's lots of flowers and things you can do some nice macros on. There's meant to be deer there as well. Uh, but I haven't been able to, to catch any or see any to take some shots of them. It's made me look at when you when you're taking photos in woodland you've really got to try and concentrate on what the subject of the image is and whether you're going to be able to pull that out in a photo or not because when you're in the trees often you'll see something but when, and take a picture but when you get home you can't it all becomes a bit of a mush um but hdr is great for doing that it can really help to sort of uh, bring out some of the sli- slightly differences in the colors and with my macros, what I've been doing a lot more is just trying some unusual angles. Um, my favourite sort of angle, my go-to angle for a macro at the moment, <coughs> excuse me, got a bit of a cough, is looking straight down on a subject. My camera is the S5700, and it's got a really great super macro mode where you can get incredibly close. But when you're that close, you do tend to put shadows over things. Whereas if you're sort of standing over the top, you can put your whole shadow over something, get the whole subject in shadow, so it doesn't really matter. Uh, so that's quite cool as well. Um, and I also like with Macro sort of trying to get unusual backgrounds as well, whether it be other foliage or um, the skyline or something like that. So yeah, it's been a been an okay week in terms of taking taking photos. Um, and it, it proves, you know, you just just go out, go for a walk, and you'd be amazed what you can uh, what you can see. I did have quite a, um, I wouldn't really call it a paradigm shift, but I was editing some photos. Um, this particular one, um, you'll find it on my Flickr photo stream. I think it's called Follow, um, and, and it's a woodland shot following a wooded a boardwalk, a path that curves through the picture. <coughs> Excuse me, and it was okay, but as I was zooming in to clone out some rubbish that was in the bottom of the picture, my wife said, "Oh, that's really nice." And I zoomed out again. I said, "What that photo?" She said, "No, no, the one before where you were zoomed in." So I zoomed in, and she said, "Oh yeah, I really, really like that." And I thought, "Well, that's a bit odd because, you know, there was no obvious horizon. There was just this path snaking through the side of the picture." He said, no, no, that looks really nice. It, it makes me really th- wonder, you know, where does that path go? And it um, got me thinking, really, about... <coughs> excuse me. About how sometimes getting 
more abstract with our sort of outside landscape pictures or any inside as well can really help focus the, the viewer on what they're looking at in the photo so you know the subject in this particular photo was the path that's what I want to take a picture of um, but maybe in taking the photo I'd come got a bit tied up in you know get getting the horizon in getting some trees in when really the subject was that path so I should have really just concentrated on that path and made it um, almost a slightly more abstract picture but it's really got me thinking about how when we're taking photographs we're trying to take the three-dimensional world in front of us and transform it into a two-dimensional image on a piece of paper on a computer screen and you lose something in that because obviously you lose lots of the depth well you lose all the depth you, you can recreate depth with um, you know shadow and um, depth of field where you're changing the focus in areas but you know the images can become quite flat and so shapes that you wouldn't necessarily see when you're standing there in real life on the flat monitor screen all of a sudden they become really strong shapes and especially if you, there's a colour associated with that shape and how this particular image you know jumped out to my wife when she was looking at it when it was zoomed up and the, the subject was really obvious and it was really this sort of S sort of shape and I've sort of been thinking about that thinking hmm you know next time I go out I'll, I'll do my wider shots as well but I'm really gonna start zooming in as well and um, I'll get or walking closer to see if I can get some more interesting abstract points I mean I don't know where I heard it from but you know one of the things says is one of the things that photographers say is if your photos aren't good enough you're not close enough and maybe that's another another aspect of that um, I think when they talked about it um, they were talking about war photography <laughs> you've got to get close to the action but it goes for landscapes and all sorts of other shots too I mean I know it works for macro because with my macro shots I try and get in really really close but then have a slightly different composition and I think they're more in interesting than just your straight here's a here's a flower sort of picture so yeah I'm going to be looking at that okay so camera form factor hmm this might seem like a bit of a strange subject to talk about um, because as sort of learning enthusiastic photographers we tend to think you know our holy grail is like a is a DSLR, a digital uh, single lens reflex camera, you know, the type with a big lens on the front. But I've been just thinking a lot more recently about how the fact that it's not it's not a great form factor, it's not a great sort of size and shape the DSLR, and that maybe we should really think about the other sort of shapes that cameras come in and sizes, and um, and maybe they're more appropriate to different types of shooting. Um, so if we start off with like your compact camera, your point and shoot, um, the great advantage of point and shoots is obviously they're small um, and unobtrusive. It can fit in your pocket. You don't need to bring a big, bring a big camera bag full of gear with you. Um, and when you're shooting things, especially people, people don't really notice if you've got a point and shoot size camera because they just think you're taking snapshots. And so it doesn't really attract that much attention. So you can get a lot more sort of candid shots and you sort of fade into the background if you're just hanging around with a point and shoot. Imagine if you're standing, say, on a, you know, in a busy street and you're just clicking away at people with a point and shoot. You know, so what? If you're standing there with a big DSLR with a... 300 mil lens on it, you know, people are going to take a lot more notice, and uh, people definitely don't think you're taking pro shots if you've got a, 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 a compact. But the way that compacts are going and point and shoots are going now is that if you if you're willing to spend a few hundred pounds, you can get really amazingly specified compacts that have really great lenses and great features as well. I mean, something like the uh, Canon G9 um, gives you full manual control, a really sharp um, lens on it can shoot in raw as well. And remember, you know, the thing I really like about compacts is you've got live view as well, so you get instant feedback of what your shot's going to look like, um, whether you're look using the screen on the back or um, or uh, looking through if it's got an electronic viewfinder. I mean, the disadvantages as well, you, you know, you don't have changeable lenses on a, on a compact point and shoot, um, though you can get add ons for the front for a wide angle as well. Uh, you've got limited focal length because the um, the uh, lens is so close to the sensor that you know with um, 
uh, with macro you can get nice depth of field effects but if something's too far away you won't get that, that same effect um, it's very difficult to fit filters to them as well like polarizers or grads you've got to normally get some sort of bracket that fits underneath or spend quite a bit of money they're not as fast as uh, more expensive DSLRs as well so if you want to do bursts of different shots um, but it's definitely worth thinking about the, the compact point and shoot form factor of having this tiny camera that you can fit in your back pocket or your jacket pocket and when you need to shoot you just whip it out and with the more expensive models you're going to come up with images that you know are up there with the, with the more expensive uh, cameras as well and you're more likely to capture those great images because you've got the camera with you rather than thinking about your largest form factors of cameras that are going to be tucked away at home in their camera bag because you can't be bothered to lug them around the next level of camera really is, is the camera I've got is a, a bridge, uh, sometimes you might call it a super zoom or a creative compact camera. So what these are is they look a bit like a mini DSLR, so for example my Fujifilm S5700. Um, so it's really a, it's a point and shoot sensor inside it and then they put, they sort of put on a big chunky um, lens on the front that means you can have up to a, a zoom factor of optically of, of 10. So you've got this device which has got the zoom capability of, you know, a DSLR really. Um, it's not as big and heavy as a DSLR and you don't have to buy any other lenses because, for example, the Fuji films, they go right from 10 times zoom to super macro where you can literally be pressing the subject up against the lens of the camera. You can't get any dust on the sensor because you can't take the lens off. Um, you've got live view because it's live view all the time because you're looking for electronic viewfinder or the screen on the back um, and when you're going out all you really need to take is your bag with your camera your tripod your filters your batteries and your spare memory and that's it really um, with the fuji uh, uh, creative uh, bridge creative compacts and lots of the others as well they give you full manual control so you've got everything from aperture priority to shutter priority to program mode um, and on the on the really expensive ones, not the S5700, but they shoot RAW as well. Um, and you can also screw filters under the front, such as polarizers, grads, coke in A's, all sorts of things. Um, the bridge cameras are, they attract more attention than the, than the than the compacts, but they're still not huge. You know, even though it's got a, a big zoom on it, it's physically small. Um, but you know the disadvantages too. The disadvantages are it's not as small as a compact, so you can't fit them in your pocket. They're not as fast as a DSLR as well. You know you can't bang off 30 frames um, a second with one of these babies. And obviously you're limited by the lens at the end of the day and the fact that they're not going to be as sharp or detailed. But they're a great. I think if you're thinking about buying a DSLR and you're just new to photography, returning to it and um, you want to improve things like your composition first and learning the technical side of it I think your bridge cameras are great um, because they're not that expensive but you get all the controls of a DSLR so you can learn about all the other things and the other great thing is because they've got all the features when you then move up to a DSLR you can really make that artist, you know, that choice about which things you have to have on it um, and I, I really like them um, I love my uh, S5700 it's a great camera, it can do loads of things. I mean, I'd love it for have a better lens and a, you know, a better sensor, but hey, it was only £100. £100. So, the sort of pinnacle would be sort of the DSLR, the Digital Single Lens Reflex Camera. Um, but remember with DSLRs, you've really got to check the specification before you buy, because they come in all sorts of flavours, from your entry-level models that are sort of £400 with a kit lens, through to ones that cost tens of thousands of pounds. And remember that some of the entry level models don't have as many features as the um, equivalent price uh, bridge cameras or, or high end compact cameras. Things like auto bracketing um, and different um, photometry modes as well. So, really check that. Just because you're getting a, uh, a DSLR doesn't mean it's going to have more features than a, than a bridge or a compact. But what you are getting with the DSLR form factor is the ability to change your lenses and lenses or glass are the thing that are going to make the most difference to uh, the sharpness and clarity of your photos and the colour that comes through. Um, and so you've got all the choices from buying um, 
macro lenses through to, to massive zooms. Um, but obviously you've got the price of that as well and the fact that you do have to buy all these different lenses if you want. But what you're going to end up with is photos that are a lot sharper, a lot tack sharper. Um, and you can customise the lens for the choice of occasion. They can be a lot faster as well in terms of you can buy lenses with very big apertures which means that the shutter speed can be very very fast even on low ISOs. So the the ultimate in control. Fast continuous shooting you can um, the more expensive models you can fire off dozens and dozens of shots um, but when you press the button. But the problem with the DSLR is they attract attention don't they you know you, you can't hide into the background when you're standing there with this this big chunk of plastic and metal with this big lens sticking off the front they're heavy to lug around especially with the lenses as well and because of that are you more likely to leave it ho at home and not get those shots but at the end of the day um, the DSLR probably c is the ultimate artistic and pre professional choice definitely you know as long as you can afford them so next time you're thinking about a camera, um, just think about that best form factor. Are you better off spending, you know, a few hundred pounds on an entry DSLR, or would you be better off spending that money on a top of the range um, compact or a, a creative uh, compact bridge type ones? <coughs> of course, I mean the best sort of situation would be to have your DSLR and then have a top of the range Canon G9 compact in your pocket as well for when you're out you know and you can't be bothered to take your DSLR with you but anyway just a few ideas to get you thinking about cameras and form factor more than anything as well okay it's time for our recommendations um, recommendation podcast for the week is Jeff Curto's camera position um, over at www cameraposition.com this one word um, it's, it's an interesting podcast this one um, he, he, he looks at lots of different um, subjects but mainly he's looking at lots of them from the point of view of, all, of using film um, and alternatives to using digital um, but he also talks a lot about developing your, your eye um, for example the latest podcast he talks about how you, can you really expect to be a better photographer unless you own photos? So we encourage you to go out and buy other people's photographs and hang them on your wall and collect photographs and build up a collection. Um, really looking at things from more of the sort of fine art side of, of photography. Um, but really good, really interesting uh, podcast. And of course the idea with having all these podcasts on your iPod or your MP3 player is that you can listen to them while you're out on a photo walk taking pictures okay recommended website for the week would be um, what we're we gonna have oh yeah one of the problems you have when you're learning about photography is although it's an artistic um, pastime it's very very technical at the same time you know you have to learn the technical side of it and understand the technical side of it to be able to produce artistic photos I mean you don't have to but it helps and uh, there's a site called digital Digital Photography Review, dpreview.com, um, which if you ever think about buying a camera, go and have a look at their reviews. You know, they literally, the reviews are 10 pages long and they go through every single thing. So they're great for that. But they've also got a really good sort of learning glossary section at um, www.dpreview.com forward slash learn forward slash question mark, I think it is. Um, <coughs> excuse me. And into that, they go into all sorts of things such as what does aperture mean, what does depth of field mean, um, uh, well, things to look at when buying a, a digital SLR, all those, all the terms that you read in magazines and on forums and in books, and you think, well, I don't really know what that means. Um, for example, I was, what was I looking at the other day? I was trying to figure out um, focal length. Um, trying to understand what focal length meant in terms of cameras. You know, why do some cameras have 50 millimeter lens? Why do some cam lenses have 200 milliliter millimeters? You know, why does my little S5700 have a focal length at, of six millimeters? And I was like, and I, I thought, oh, that's tiny. Why is that? But I looked at their their section and they explained all about the fact that when you have smaller um, sensors, you have to have a much smaller focal length, um, and you you have to convert things. Um, if you want to compare it to other cameras, to, to the 35mm, so you can understand what you're talking about. And, uh, well, while I'm at it, you know, the folk, the um, 
that all relates to how far the lens is away from the sensor and I got that from dpreview.com so head over there just browse through the different sections and you'll learn loads of things and you once you start to understand these things you start to understand how the camera works a little bit better as well so uh, so yeah definitely recommend it uh, Flickr photo stream who are we going to be looking at this week um, oh right yeah these guys oof, oh, these guys are really really cool they're called G2 Studio um, on Flickr so if you go to uh, flickr.com slash photos slash roger underscore taylor underscore 85 again I'll put these um, links in the um, in the podcast notes on www.robnunfoto.com robnunfoto.com um, you'll see these guys um, and they are oh, amazing pictures um, that, that, they, that they bring out um, they do lots of HDR shots, um, lots of shots well where, where they do montages of different pictures together. But they're just they're like posters, you know. They're like, they're like art. The, these guys, what these guys do, the pictures inside churches and things like that will blow you away. You'll be amazed. The colours are just so vibrant um, and they're so crisp. Um, really, really nice. Really inspirational stuff to look at. And you know, if you're a member of Flickr. Add them to your contact so that when they do something new, you can have a look at it and you go, "Oh wow!" And it sort of inspires you to go out and take pictures of your s- pictures yourself. Okay, recommended Flickr group to join this week. Um, this is um, called a Flickr group called Paths. So if you go to um, f- uh, www.flickr.com forward slash groups forward slash Caminhos, C-A-M-I-N-H-O-S. I think that's Spanish for pools, or just search for it. You know, um, paths um, in, the, in the Flickr search thing. It's a, the the idea behind this group is any, any picture you take must have a path or a trail or some steps or a road or something in the picture, leading you through the picture. And paths and trails and roads are all really good for leading lines for leading your eyes for for an image so go through and have a look through the pictures in the pool um, some are really good some are not so good um, but there's some fantastic ones in there and by looking at these images all the time <coughs> excuse me you're really starting to train your eye into seeing these when you're out on walking um, on your own photo walks or when you're out and about and you want to take some pictures um, and often pictures with some sort of trail or river or path in them can be really dynamic. Um, I remember they can be inside or outside, um, loads of different ones. So if you head on over to the Paths Flickr group, um, you'll definitely uh, won't be disappointed. And join and submit your own pictures as well. OK, well, that's it for this week. Uh, if you've got any questions or comments or suggestions for the site or the uh, this podcast um, you can contact me at uh, I'm scalespeeder that's S-C-A-L-E-S-P-E-E-D-R at gmail.com or you can go to um, <coughs> excuse me go to www.robnonphoto.com um, and there's a contact form or if you if you leave a if you go to the uh, podcast um, latest um, page leave a question on the bottom of there or that will get to me too um, and uh, well thanks for listening um, please visit Um please go over to I've created a Flickr group for the site as well so join and submit your own photos and uh, join in the discussion there um, there's only I think there's three of us at the moment so we need a few more um, that would be great and um, happy shooting this week and I'll see you on Flickr